the events of 9/11 constitute the end of of one era and the promise of change this is a dramatic assault upon western and the leader and its institutions that have dominated our region this is a domination that continued for 250 years after that the process of change did not take place peacefully the west hegemon responded with brutal armed force across afghanistan and iraq but the resistance forces had already sorted themselves out and gave a fitting reply to the vision of the neocons for domination in a resurrected 21st century scenario what the british had attempted in the 19th and early 20th century so that scenario is today in retreat the arab spring is the culmination of this change first assault was done by the radicals but the radicals today are do not constitute the most significant aspect of this extraordinary revolutionary change that is today uh, that is today knocking at the doors of world order in the context of the arab spring we see the toppling after 50 or 60 years of tyrant who had who had consistently subserved the interests of the west at the expense of the interests of their own people they were therefore mired in a very pervasive political and economic But simultaneously, there have been other significant changes, less dramatic, but equally significant. For at least the ten years, for at least ten to fifteen years, we have been hearing about the economic resurgence of Asian countries, China, India, the consolidation of the achievements of Japan, and the strengthening of the economy of Korea. And then again, you have similar achievements, less dramatic, but equally important. By the time the decade had ended, this day, the, by the time the last decade ended, you truly had a sense of a resurgent Asia. This is the Asia that is today engaged with the Gulf. Obviously, the most significant engagement is economic. But over the last few years, the relationship has been qualitatively transformed. in the sense that the bulk of the energy resources of the gulf today are consumed within asia and indeed are responsible for the growth rates of asia similarly our economic engagement for each of the major asian countries their ties with the gcc and the other gulf countries is the most significant aspect of their economic engagement starting with india our number one economic partner country wise is the uae a number one economic partner as a regional grouping is the gcc we will we have we get 70 to 80% of our energy resources from the gulf alone there are similar patterns to be observed which are available in the research and they are available in the public domain we have beyond this a burgeoning political relationship from the beginning from the middle of the last decade onwards every country of the gulf reached out to asia as part of a look east policy india was central to this and slowly as a strategic economic partnership a strategic energy partnership enshrined in the delhi declaration following the visit of king abdullah became a new era of strategic partnership in the riyadh declaration four years later this kind of strategic and security related engagement is today taking place across the region and this is not just in india every other major asian country has today emerged because each of them separately each of them separately recognizes the crucial interest they have in the security and stability of the gulf and how and they are completely convinced that this crucial element in their national interest cannot be left in the, in the unsafe hands of western hegemony anymore so therefore you have certain challenges because
because every time you have a new scenario and you have to think new thoughts, it is extremely intellectually, culturally, they dominate they, as they have dominated our discourse. Asia has been systematically divided from the sense of Asia that we had in 1947 withered away in front of the uh, I mean, in, the, in front of the Cold War. Today, every sub-region of Asia is divided and has contentions that are historic and that have been refreshed during the Cold War. So this is the most important challenge before us. How do you develop Asian consensus? How do you develop consensus on issues of national interest that you recognize separately but are not able to do so consensually? You have issues all across Asia. You have issues in West Asia between Saudi Arabia and Iran. You have issues in Northeast Asia between Japan and China. You have issues in South Asia between India and Pakistan. But this is a daunting task. This is a time where we have to think new thoughts. These thoughts, because this is a medium to long term scenario, governments are not capable of this kind of long term thought. It is something that has to emerge from academia. But this is the principal challenge. The second challenge before us is within the Gulf itself. The Gulf for so long, for so many decades, used to depend entirely on the United States for its security. And in return for their security, subserve the interests of the United States, both in terms of energy, in terms of the interest of Israel, and in terms of their strategic interests across the region. When the Americans wanted to intervene in Afghanistan as part of the Cold War, their strongest supporters came and from other Asian countries. So this kind of strategic support was crucial, constituted the backbone of GCC and Gulf security. And if someone did not fall in line, then you had the fate that was meted out to Iraq and the confrontation that now persists with the Iranian authorities and the people. So how do you shape this challenge? How do you cope with this challenge? If you go to the internet and you press the two words Gulf security, you get 60 million hits. So everyone knows what an important issue this is. But this kind of pattern, this kind of challenge of how do you bring together on the same platform issues that have divided the Gulf over so many decades can be reconciled and given a new spirit. The third challenge we have is what to do with the former hegemons. The United States. The United States is particularly difficult to deal with because it has no history of of an alliance, of an, of an alliance based on mutual respect and equality. It either has a subordinate whom it pushes around or it has an enemy. How do you make this hegemon compromise, dilute his aggressiveness and become part of a world order in which it can play a role that is constructive, that is not militaristic, that is not destructive? Because that is the first option that he exercises, immediate option military. And look at the price they have paid as a country and as a people. Then you have the challenge before the Europeans. In this entire seminar, we have never discussed Europeans. And very often the European Union diplomats used to ask me, what do you think of our foreign policy? And they very sadly, the answer was, do you have one? Uh, they have been so self-absorbed. They have been so self-absorbed in terms of putting together and giving shape to their own entity, the European Union, that they have never played a constructive role which they have the potential to do. They have never played a constructive role in this region. This, they, they have the capacity, they have played a destructive role because they, it is part of domestic affairs where you find strutting around the French president, struts around in a bogus uniform and tries to recover some of the Napoleonic glory. And we completely forget that Napoleon went his Waterloo. So there is no future in this kind of aggressiveness. Wherever you go in our region, you will be burnt. You have an opportunity to play a constructive role. There are new things that have happened across the region. The time to think new thoughts is now upon us.